says that we can get these videos online. So, um, which will be good, because if you miss things. So I noticed that from the last test, the Jung, the Jung test, I was doing a, looking at the analysis of it, and I noticed that obviously people who missed the, the lecture on Jung obviously didn't do as well as people who were here for the lecture. Also looking at it, when I'm, when I'm talking, I'm looking out at people, and I'm kind of taking some things in, and I'm noticing you know, who's taking notes and who's not. I'm really making little mental notes of it, because I'm curious to see how people do on that. And of course, surprise, surprise, the people who, are, who seemingly, anyway, are taking the best notes, or the most notes, anyway, in terms of volume, seem to be doing better on the tests as well. Um, remember that the articles that we're looking at will give you some of the answers. As I'm lecturing to you, I'm giving you all of the answers that things are going to be on the test. And I don't want it to be something that's surprising. I'm not trying to trick you, like, well, what, was, what was the fifth word of my lecture? It's nothing like that. Um, if you just follow the basic guidelines, if I write something on the board, you should be writing it down in your notes. If I say something twice, if I repeat myself, if I say something twice, you should say be writing something. that down. Say and, something and then the hard one, by the way, for most of us, is if I say something that's new to you, in other words, some piece of information that you didn't know before, you should write that down too. Rather than passively go, that's interesting, or worse yet, I didn't know that, or worse yet, who cares. Those are the things that you should be writing down. Don't assume that you're going to remember anything that you, that, that you hear in here. Um, so, there you go. So as always, I mentioned before, I've got notes I'm working off of, and the purpose of the notes is just so that I'm sure that I cover everything that I'm going to be asking you um, on, on the test. So, all right, so we're starting with, with Socrates, and we're going to move into the allegory of the cave, which is his most famous thing. And some of you, and I know, have read the allegory of the cave before in, in other classes, but I'm going to submit to you that we're going to be looking at it from its, from its actual philosophical underpinnings, not this idea. How many of you have read the allegory of the cave before and know something about it? Yeah. The way that we typically teach it is, you know, the world that you see is not, is not the real world. And then that's usually how it's taught. But I'm telling you, man, it is so much deeper than just that. It, it's, it's so incredibly deep. That I'll, I'll go so far as to say that it deals with the most fundamental que questions of existence. And how it is that we understand that, whether we believe it or not, whether it's true or not, is everything. And I mean that quite literally. It gets down to whether or not the soul survives death, whether or not existence um, you know, um, comes after, after death. So it's a huge question, man. The, the biggest question in the world. Oh, by the way, um, someone out last year asked me if, they're, if, if you're allowed to record my lectures and things in class. Yes, you're allowed to record what I, what I do in class. Um, it's not, again, I'm not trying to surprise anybody. Um, all I ask is that if you record it, record the whole thing. Don't <laughs> splice it up and, you know, like make like an F-word montage to throw all the <laughs> 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 You're giving us ideas. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Then you have to wonder if I'm doing that consciously or if, you're, or if I'm putting something in your unconscious. It's good. It's probably happened before. It has happened before. It has happened before. All right. So we're looking at uh, again Socrates. And so Socrates, born in eh, 469 or so. Um, we'll call it 470. Make it easy. And we'll make it 470. Make it easy. And he dies in 399 BC. Not that his birth year doesn't matter, but there's some discrepancies. It's either, four, it's either uh, 469 or 470 BC. Dies in 399. So he lives to be about 71, 70 years old. Okay. Now, he has a very famous student, who I've mentioned a few times. Who is it? You like playing with it when you were a kid. Plato. Plato, yeah, it's Plato. 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 So, yeah, Plato is, is the his name. That's his famous student. And then Plato had a very famous student. Anybody? Uh, Aristotle. Yes, Aristotle. Very good. And then Aristotle, along with Plato, along with Socrates, forms the foundation of, of our Western culture, Western understanding of the world around us. In fact, a uh, very famous 20th century philosopher, Wittgenstein, said that all philosophy and the whole of course of Western philosophy is just footnotes to, to Socrates. And then, of course, his... Exactly. The whole ideas of democracy come, and, and come, come from this time period anyway. But we're going to find out in this short time that Socrates absolutely hated democracy. Okay. He thought it was horrible. And we'll see why. So the main um, thing that we're looking at here is his epistemology. And epistemology is essentially the study of how we know what we know. Epistemology means, means knowledge, ology, study of. So epistemology is how we know what we know. So if I were to ask you, how do you know what you know? 
You know, when you gain information, you gain knowledge, how do you know? Like, how do you gain knowledge? Our brain. Our brain. What about it? It gets transferred from other people. How? Verbally. Okay, so you hear it. So you hear information, and then after you see it, yeah, so you can see it, you can hear it. Our five senses. Yeah, our five senses. So, what's that? We smell things, we taste them, we touch them. If I said to you that an oven is hot, you work with like a little kid, and you tell a little kid, oh, oh oven is hot. And the little kid will hear it and go, hot. <laughs> and the kid, I guess, knows something a little bit. But then when you walk away, the kid goes, <laughs> screams, you know? Now that kid has learned something. Right? They could learn no other way. Now they absolutely know about this. But again, two different ways of learning. So now, sometimes depending on how it is or what you're learning, certain senses will be better than others. From that case there, you'd rather learn from hearing, right? But sometimes you've got to grab the little kid's hand and stick it on the hot plate, right? Just so it learns. Yeah. Right? Yes. You guys are sick. <laughs> you Social agree? services. Yeah, I'm going to take, sure. names, yeah, I'm gonna take some names down after this. And I've got some referrals for you. happened to me before. Oh, jeez, I'm sorry about that, man. We'll talk to your uncle afterwards. <laughs> okay. So, if all of our knowledge is, it comes from these five senses. And, and by the way, there's a few ways of looking at knowledge and where it comes from. The first one is going to be called materialism. And you can think of materialism as coming to us through this thing called empiricism. And empiricism is essentially the idea that we, you know that, that you can learn things through these through these senses. And materialism is, this, is the assertion that all, that all knowledge comes through these five senses. And so that all, all knowledge is five senses. Because the whole universe itself is only physical. So that means that you know, the whole universe is this physical stuff that you can touch, taste, feel, hear, and so forth. And that means that you're learning things empirically. Empirically is essentially this formation of the... Of the very, very simply, maybe overly simply stated, but the uh, foundation of Western um, scientific method, empirical, empirical studies, <coughs> that's using your five senses. And that asserts, of course, that all that exists in the world is what's material, the material world around us. Now, of course, this is problematic. Um, so if it's on two counts, first count, um, have you ever... Have your five senses ever been deceived? Yes. What's an example of your five senses being deceived? You smell something and you think it's one thing, but it's Chicken something else. Yeah. So you, you think you smell something, but you're not actually smelling what's, what's actually being smelled? Yeah, that's what we were talking about last year. Like you're walking through the hallway. You ever walk through the hallway and you think you hear your name and you stop and you're looking yeah. around. Or you hear the ice cream truck. Yeah, 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 you think you hear the ice cream truck. So we know from there that, that your hearing is oftentimes mistaken. Um, you ever, how about if you, if, you, if you go to a pool and you stick your arm into the pool, what happens to your arm? Well, besides getting wet, what looks like happens to your arm? It's like it burns. It's like it bends. Now, when you put your arm in the water, does your arm break and snap? Yes. And you know, ah, and then you take it out, the air all of a sudden heals it, and your arm's fine again. <laughs> yeah, it's because of reflection and light waves, it looks like it's bending, but it's really not. So your eyes are deceived in that case. Now, those are very simple and kind of rudimentary ways of, of seeing it, but you can see how those problems compound. Now, if it's true that all of our knowledge comes from these five senses, we understand, therefore, that, that the, there's a problem that our five senses are often deceived, which means that our knowledge is faulty. So, which means that we can't really be certain of things, which puts us in a really chaotic place in the universe. Because we can't really trust our five senses, we can't trust anything. So, therefore, it's difficult for us to, to make an assertion that we have any knowledge at all. So far, so good? Second problem, if it's true that all of our knowledge comes from the five senses, how is it that you have knowledge of things that you've never experienced before? So, for example, have you ever... Yes. Name something that you've experienced that is perfect. And I don't mean perfect in the sense of like, oh, it's hyperbole, I'm just exaggerating, but it's actually without flaw. Like yeah, name something that you've ever experienced 
that is literally, not figuratively, but literally without flaw. Can you give an example? Like I can't. Like a, like so, you can, so you can maybe get, you know, not miss any questions on a test. You know? So in other words, you, 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 you completed a task. But the actual notion of, of perfection itself, I'll give you a heads up. You've never experienced it before. And yet you know what it is. And so, you follow and so the, we might think of it as, well, that's whatever. No, but that's a very deep <coughs> thing. Because that means that you seem to have knowledge of things that you've never actually experienced before. Like answering things on a test, you're, you're completing a task, you know? But you've never experienced a perfect circle. You've never had a perfect cave before. You've never experienced infinity, by the way. But you know what these things are. And that's a strange thing, because if it's true that all of our knowledge comes from those five senses, then... There means we have knowledge that didn't come from those five senses. And you're going to notice that these are things that are not physical. Because we only have names for things that exist. You know, give, uh, give me an example of a thing that we have a word for that doesn't exist. Well, save you the next you know, 45 years of your life. No such thing exists. We don't, have, we don't have words for anything that doesn't exist. We only have concepts for things that exist. So Socrates is, is identifying that we have these couple of problems. One being that we have knowledge of things. So if all of our senses, if all of our knowledge comes from five senses, our five senses are often deceived, which means our knowledge is incomplete. Secondly, we seem to have knowledge of things that we've never experienced before. And that's problematic. Because both of those things are going to call this into question. Materialism. Especially so far. All right. Secondly, we have another idea, another notion of, um, of uh, knowledge called idealism. And that's going to say, all knowledge comes to the mind. Yeah. Big brain power. Yeah, big brain power. <laughs> all of your knowledge comes to the mind. Now, the mind, he's not talking about it as part of the brain. It's something separate and distinct. It's non-material. So he's going to, so which is the hell of an assertion, because now he's pointing out that you're not just a body. You're not just a physical thing, but that you're actually more than that. You're also with this disembodied thing called the mind. And so all of your knowledge, he says, that all of your true knowledge comes through the mind. Now, are there things that you can know? He distinguishes between belief and, and something called true belief, we might say, or true knowledge. So there are things that you can know, but you don't know that you know it. Huh? <laughs> One example. Okay, so let's say you take a little kid, and you teach the little kid their numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You make a song out, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And then you ask that little kid, now, I have a serious question for you. Of course, kids are very serious. What is one plus two? What's that kid going to say? Um, Think about the song. Think about the song. It's not a trick question, by the way. Three. Three. And why would the kid say three? Because he sang the song. It comes after two. One, two, three. What's one <coughs> plus two? And the kid, because he knows the song, says three. three. Oh my God, this kid's a genius. <laughs> <laughs> this kid is how, how old this is. That's how old the kid is. And the kid knows how to, how to do math. And we're like, oh my God, this kid's going to be a genius. You know, oh, that's a kid who has a thing that we would say is a true belief. A true belief. In other words, the kid has a belief that happens to be true. But the kid doesn't have knowledge. The kid isn't doing math. Because then you decide to test this kid. All right, since you're so good at this, what is 4 plus 5? And the kid says very confidently, 7. Oh. It's retarded. <laughs> I thought it was a genius. But that line is so narrow between the two, between genius and, and, and moron. And so you, you know, so tell the kid to go back to eating crayons or whatever they do. Because the kid doesn't have actual knowledge. You know? So these are two separate and distinct things. Socrates points out that if you're gaining your knowledge through materialism, you have essentially... 
You have some beliefs that might turn out to be true, but you don't have knowledge because your five senses deceive you and you don't know when they're deceiving you. However, if you're gaining your knowledge through idealism, he argues the mind is incorruptible. And so what you have is actual true knowledge. Actual true knowledge. And then there's a third way of, 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 uh, of doing epistemology. And this is, of course, the coward's way. It's called rationalism. Rationalism is that, is that AP who deals with a fight between you and somebody else by saying, well, aren't you both wrong in this situation? But you're both right also. And that's what rationalism is. It combines materialism and idealism. It says you gain knowledge both ways. So it combines materialism and idealism. Rationalism. So of course, Socrates would say, ah, you don't get knowledge either of those ways. So, so you don't get knowledge this way. So he'll argue that you only get knowledge through your mind, which of course now makes thinking kind of preeminent among, above almost anything else in the world. So if you want truth, well, if you don't use your five senses, what do you do? You sit and you think about it. And then it only comes through your thinking. And then if your thinking is, is precise and sharp and tuned enough, through that, therefore, you can derive actual true knowledge. That's all. So, questions? Yeah. Does Carl Jung's, um, uh, does, does he fit in idealism? Maybe. Maybe. Ask me in half an hour. Hopefully, oh, if I'm fast enough, ask me in half an hour. Yeah, so you're going to see that. Uh, that will make more sense when we get there. But yeah, it's a hell of a question. The answer is... Maybe. Coward. Jung coward. Might go, yeah, might, yeah, Jung might go more towards rational. Jung's a coward. He doesn't commit to one or the other, even if it's right or wrong. But yeah, he, he absolutely has very strong idealism in his, in his psychology. Yeah. Yeah. Because he, of course, and of course most psychologists will. Versus a psychiatrist who's dealing more with the brain than the mind. Okay. Any questions about it all? all right. I'm going to talk a little bit about Socrates now. Socrates. Yeah, Socrates. Do uh, you know much about Socrates? Have yeah. you heard some things about Socrates? Yeah. Anybody <coughs> play Assassin's Creed Odyssey? The thing, yeah. the thing, wasn't he like a bum? Like, 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 like a bum? A bum? No, but like he lived in like, I don't know, such a different he was um, unemployed, <laughs> so <laughs> he wandered like in the streets, like telling people things, and he, they thought he was crazy. Yeah. They didn't think he was crazy, but yeah, he wandered in the street and he, and he pissed people off, and he did it intentionally, by the way. He was all about that that injury to conscious learning that Thomas Sass talks about. Yeah, he set out to to injure people's self esteem by making them conscious of what they don't know. He referred to himself as the gadfly of Athens. So he's an, he's an Athenian. He's from Athens. And he refers to himself as a gadfly. Meaning that he, he feels that a gadfly is a, it's a fly that goes around and stings horses and stuff like that. And it just irritates them. He thought that was his job. Was to walk around Athens and, um, and um, irritate people. Which I guess actually we can jump right to his, um, his wife. He was married. Um, a woman named Santa. I mention her all the time because she becomes very famous throughout history. Because she was a woman who has become kind of the print, like the archetype of a horrible wife. And she was an absolute, she has a reputation for being an absolute raging bitch of a wife. You know? And she really was. She was a horrible person. Um, I can give you some examples. Um, and again, I, I'm sorry if this upsets some of you. I know it probably will because she's so extreme. But try to contain it um, because of where we are. But she, so they had three kids together. She expected him to actually stick around and raise the kids. Yeah, I know. I know. Let <sighs> <I> me. <mean, laughs> not only that, by the way, she expect, she wanted him to get a job. Oh, no. Wow. Yeah, I know. Some of you are triggered right now. Like what? She wanted him to, to grow up and be a mature human being? I know. Please I know. tell me she washed the dishes. I know. <laughs> but that's, so because of that, she, she's known throughout history as being the archetype of a nagging wife. 
because she wanted him to help, you know, actually be at home and help raise the kids rather than wandering the streets like a bum. And she wanted him to actually get a job and contribute in some meaningful way, not just this philosophy stuff. So he, it's a great quote for him, from him where he says, Socrates very pointedly says, you should get married. If you find yourself a good wife, you'll be happy. And if you find yourself a horrible wife, you'll become a philosopher. <laughs> and then, of course, all the guys sat around, oh, <laughs> pointing at her. <laughs> but when you look at, at, at their life together, he only got to do philosophy because of her. She came from a very wealthy family. She was very well connected within the politics of Athens. In fact, the only reason that he was alive as long as he was was because it, she, he was married to her. People are like, we should kill that Socrates guy. Ah, he's married to Samson, and you know who her family is. Yeah, but you know, he should die sometimes. Yeah, he, he was very well privileged because of who he was married to. That's her wealth, her position, all that, is what allowed him to walk around and do philosophy. So it always bothers me, like, you know, you, read, like, you watch um, Shakespeare's Taming of the Shrew, and he makes a reference, there's a, 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 a very nagging wife in that, in that play, and Shakespeare compares her to, to Samson, and he just sits and goes like, that's terrible. So it always bothers me that she gets this really horrible rap through history, for when all she expected him to do was just kind of stick around, help raise kids, and get a job. But for that, just for that, she's remembered as like the archetype of a, of a terrible wife, which is um, not good. Um, well, he fought in the Peloponnesian War, so he was a soldier. Um, any of you guys see 300? Yeah. Okay, that was him. Yeah, he fought. Uh, he, he fought in that war. Um, and I'm not just saying this right out of stall because I can't remember how to spell Peloponnesian. But it's a Persian. Something like that. <laughs> Peloponnesian. For some reason, if I'm sitting at my desk, I can write it. As soon as I get in front of you, I'll forget how to spell it. I think this is accurate. But it's the Peloponnesian War. And that was a war among a lot of the Greek states. And specifically, and obviously in his case, Athens against. Who did they fight against? Not, not Persia, but the other ones. The dudes would kick people in the big bottomless pits. Sparta. Sparta, yeah. So he, so it was Athens against Sparta, and Sparta wins, by the way. <coughs> yeah. Um, but he fights in this war, and he fights, by the way, apparently very honorably. But he saves the life of a guy during this war named Alcibiades, uh, and in not in a particular battle, but Alcibiades. If any of you guys remember playing Assassin's Creed Odyssey? Yes. Alcibiades is the guy who shows up constantly throughout the throughout the, um, the the game. And Alcibiades is not a good dude. Alcibiades looked at the landscape and said, "Man, Sparta's going to win this war." And so he 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 became a traitor and he went and fought for for Sparta. And then after the war was over, he just kind of shows back up in Athens like nothing happened. <laughs> hey, what's up, guys? By the way, didn't you fight for the back, for the other side? Uh, you know, the war is over. We should let things go. So Alcibiades is very hated in, in Athens. And Socrates is good friends with him. And Socrates doesn't shy away from that. In fact, at one point, he, they're telling a story where Alcibiades points out and says, Socrates, check this out, guys. Socrates saved my life during the war. And everyone kind of looks at him like, you saved the traitor's life? And he's like, I did. He's a good dude. Yeah. Um, that would be like, uh, like, imagine if Hitler walks in here, obviously you have lots of questions. But let's say he walks in here and he walks at the Lord and puts it around the Lord and says, this is the one right here, man. This is the one you want to listen to. This is my girl. And you're like, what, what, me? Hitler? No, no, I don't even know you. Ah, oh, whatever, man. You know we grew up together. Come on. Hey, listen to what she says. She's brilliant. I'm on your side. Remember, I'm always Team Lord. And then he walks back out. We all go. You're friends with Hitler? No, this he's is, my great grandpa. She's still. <laughs> yeah, same idea. Yeah, that would be kind of like when Socrates comes along and says he's still friends with Alcibiades. Yeah, he's a good dude and all that stuff. So that should give you a heads up about, about how the people of Athens saw, um, saw him. Now, we think of him as, as being a teacher, but he denied being a teacher. He said that he never really taught anybody anything because ultimately he was unemployed. You know, he didn't have a job. And so he argued that, that teaching was a, was a profession and one in which he never engaged. Okay? Any questions so far? All right.
So remember, the um, big thing with the Peloponnesian War, he saves Alcibiades' life. And from that, Socrates starts to develop his, his political philosophy. And there's a reason that he, did, that he does not shy away from, from, from supporting Alcibiades. And that's because Socrates is very much on, on virtue and doing the right thing, no matter what, at, at, at doing the right thing as he saw it. So he, he looks at Sparta, and he thinks that Sparta is a wonderful culture. You know, that they're, that they're, that they're, he argues that their culture is superior to Athens. So when people are talking about the war that they just lost, the Athenians, Socrates is like, I can tell you why, why we lost. Why? <coughs> oh, because we're a horrible, disgusting, degenerate culture. And Sparta is a superior culture. So yeah, they beat us and they should have beaten us. In fact, Socrates even gets hired as a tutor. When the, when the Spartans come in, they send a group of 70 people in to, to, to rule over the Athenians. Socrates becomes the teacher and, and tutor of, of, the, of, the, of them. And so I'll tell you all about us. And he becomes, especially the head guy who runs it, he becomes the tutor of that guy. So Socrates is seen as a traitor. He's seen as a guy who goes around intentionally trying to, trying to piss people off. He does not have a great reputation. But in Socrates' defense, there's a reason he does that. So, for example, so he believes that essentially there are five forms of government. And we'll, I'll lay them out to you, they'll make sense more of him as, as we get to the end of it. He believes that the best form of government, the top form of government, is called an aristocracy. Aristocracy. Now, an aristocracy is not what we think of it as, where you've got like kings and Queens and has passed down through the through based on your world? No, not yet. That'll be number three. But it's based off of merit. In other words, you deserve to be on top. And he has a very specific way of determining who deserves to be on top. And he, the, the group that he thinks should be up there is take a guess. What group of people should rule over everyone else? Philosophers. Philosophers. Yeah, that's better. Last period, someone said white people. <laughs> and I said, obviously, but who else? <laughs> yeah, philosophers, but a very specific group of philosophers. And he called them the philosopher kings. White philosophers? White philosophers. <laughs> philosopher kings. Are there any other types? <laughs> Aristotle. So the philosopher kings. He argues that the philosopher kings are people who rule because they should rule. And here's, how, here's where you get your philosopher kings from. He argues that, that we all have a nature. That when you're born, you have a nature. That will make sense in a bit. And so when you're born, you, all you have to do is look at a schoolyard, look at a playground, look at kids playing, and you're going to find that out. So for example, there's, that, there's those kids who go run, running around together, and one kid turns, they all turn, and they all chase each other, and they're all part of like, the same group. Those are your workers. Those are the people who just kind of follow and, and do their thing, you know, and you know, they don't harm anybody, they just, they, they just do what they're told, basically. You have another group of people. Those are the kids who sit there, and as, and as the kids run by, you trip them. And they go over there and punch them. Give me your lunch money. Those are your kids who are going to be your soldiers. They, they know, in other words, they demonstrate a natural aggression. So the job of society is going to be to take those kids who are workers, and shape them into that thing that, that they are. In other words, they're already born with, as a, with, as, with a nature of being workers, so you make them the best they possibly can be. Those bullies that you find, it's society's job to shape them into becoming soldiers, so that they have honor and, and all that. So you, you, know, you channel it. And then once in a while, you get those really, really rare kids who stand there in the corner and watch, and they see the bully push, and they go, this is not right. And they're very deliberate. You know, they're, those are the very calm, thinking children. And maybe once in a while you'll get one who kind of goes over and indicates this is wrong, you should not be doing this, or you know, whatever it is. Yeah, maybe he gets his ass kicked. But, <laughs> but, but this is the kid who seems to stand for, for inherently for like things like justice and kindness and mercy and all that. Those are those little kids that when you notice them, you go and you sweep them up and take them away. Tina? I was about to make an uncle joke, but I'm not going to. But yeah, essentially not kidnap them, but, but it's, it's, I guess kidnap them. Parents don't really have a choice. But the idea is that you take that one kid and you say, this kid has a nature that leans towards justice and towards right thinking and towards you know, virtue. And so we're going to make, we're going to really make that, we're going we're to exploit that and make this kid like that. the archetype of what that thing is. And then that's the kind of person he says that you want ruling over you. So these are, these are specialists who are geared towards what's the proper function of your government and so forth. But they're rare. But you do come across them. Think of them as like little Jedi. 
You gotta get a hold of them when they're young, otherwise, you know, before they're corrupted by the world around them. And so those are the ones who he thinks should rule. But that's the best form of government, people who specialize in that. You have another type of government underneath that, which is a democracy. Yeah, if your name democracy. Is Tim. What's that? If your name is Tim. If your name is Tim, you get to be in charge. Um, and this is ruled by the honorable. By the honorable. Now, which group of people do we think of as like honor, commitment, duty? Who are those folks? Right, soldiers. Soldiers. Yeah, yeah, soldiers. So this is going to be kind of a rule by soldiers. Military rule. But, but, but it isn't a matter of like the soldiers ruling over you and being like, you can do what we say, and hitting you with the blood of rifles or spears back there. But the idea is that they, their highest virtue is, is honor. For them up here, the highest thing is virtue, doing the right thing. Over here, eh, honor. Be an honorable person. Sometimes you do the wrong thing, but you're doing it based off of honor. So he argues that this is the best. We can't have that. This is the second best. And then from there, we start to have a downward spiral. Third one, oligarchy. Oh, Ruled by the church? No, but by something else instead. What is it? By religion? Yeah. Oh, no, I don't know. You said it earlier. A higher <coughs> Oh, by wealth? Yeah, by wealth. And so the idea is that wealth replaces merit and honor. <coughs> So who do we follow? The wealthy. The person who makes the world. Yeah, the people who, who make the most money. And we see elements of that today. Right? We'll talk about a, a YouTube personality. We'll be like, oh my god, they're so stupid. Or, and then people will like follow him and go, oh yeah, and then all the people who follow him, I can't believe it. Do you watch him? Well, yeah, but just because it's so stupid, well, of course you're contributing to it. But then, there's always that person in the corner who after we get done just thrashing this person says, yeah, but they're making money. And then we all go, yeah. <laughs> like, like somehow that's a good enough thing. That's this right here. We, we admire wealth way more than merit and honor. We admire wealth way more than merit and honor. So now, you know, if, if you can do something dishonorable, but you can get paid out of it, you know, that's it right there. <coughs> so far, so good. Now things get really bad. The next worst, uh, the next one, democracy. Yeah. So that means that everybody gets a vote. So if you're that person who sits there and and and, and um, conscientiously studies the voting guide, you get to know the issues. You look into the candidates. You come up with a well-formed, rational opinion. You get your ballot, and you go down and say, "I am going to vote." And you go down there and you take your vote very seriously. And then there's that person in the booth next to you who's picking their nose, who's going to vote for the person based on who has the most number of vowels in their name. <laughs> Your vote counts just as much as that person's vote as democracy. So he argued that democracy is essentially, it's, it's tyranny. But it's tyranny by majority. So if a bunch of people just kind of agree on something, then that's just what gets taken over. So we, all, yeah, we all agree. So an example I use is, one of my favorite examples is, uh, you remember that Arnold Schwarzenegger was governor of California mm -hmm. for a while? Then we know how that happened. Yeah, no. people just wanted to yeah, see money. how it went. Kind of. Not even yeah, he had but money. He had fame. But what happened was there was a governor, it has to do with the money, there was a governor before him named Gray Davis. And Gray Davis was, um, he won the election, he served for whatever it was, what's, four years, six, six years, I think he was, he was governor. I suppose I should know that. <laughs> and at the end of the term, he gives, um, he gets up for re-election, and while he's going for a re-election, he's running on this campaign of, California, man, we are prosperous. Look at us. Whatever we are, like $8 billion in surpluses, everything is great. Under my, under my leadership, blah, blah, blah. So he runs, he, he wins re-election, Gray Davis. And then after the election, November, January, he comes about and he gives a, a state of the state address and says, uh, I got level with you. Remember how I told you that we were doing really well? Yeah. Turns out we're not $8 billion in the black. We're actually $42 billion in the red. We're going to cut services all across the board. We're going to have to cut education, police, fire, everything across the board. So the politician comes along and essentially misstates the budget by about $50 billion. Do you think like he you knew know. two months earlier that we were $42 billion in the red? Um, yes. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he, turned, he knew. But he knew that if he came out and said, 
Yeah. You know how I've been in charge the past few years? Yeah, I screwed that up. <laughs> you know, but give me another chance, I'll fix it. So they got the the electors were uh, so they, yeah the electorate was so angry that they launched a recall and said kick him out of office. So they had a special election because enough people you know, signed a petition to have a special election to throw him out of office. That's what happened. And then that's when Schwarzenegger says, I will run for governor. <laughs> and so we're like, well, the politician screwed it up. This guy's really strong. <laughs> and I really, you know, Terminator, AI, 